Okay, next up is Southern Methodist University. Uh, Southern Methodist University does a lot of different things. Uh, we've had them talk previously about quantum and about cyber in general. And today they're going to talk about their cyber autonomy range. Uh, there are a few unique things that um, Southern Methodist University offers as far as their research. And I believe that um, that Mitch is going to go over those as far as who can and can't participate and their ability to be able to restrict research students from from countries. So that is a, a unique capability that most universities do not possess. So I will go ahead and turn this over to, to Mitch. Uh, again, unmute yourself if you have a question, raise your hand. This is open and interactive. Go ahead, Mitch. Thank you so much, Eugene, and thank you all for attending. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a new facility we have and its capabilities called the Cyber Autonomy Range today. And uh, a brief introduction to myself, I am a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and I'm also the director of a research institute at SMU uh, that Eugene alluded to called the Darwin Deason Institute for Cybersecurity. And I can make all this contact information available. I think it's in the email from Eugene. So let me start by giving an, a very brief uh, description of our overarching institute, the, the Institute for Cybersecurity. So our mission is, of course, not surprisingly, to advance the science of cybersecurity through basic and problem-driven research. And that problem-driven part of the mission statement is very important because that means we don't just do academic, write journal papers, solve equation types of work. We do that too, but we try to do things that have high impact in the near future. So we do have a variety of capabilities and these pictures give you an idea of some of those. The one in the upper left is uh, the cyber autonomy range, which I'm going to be talking about more for the rest of the presentation. But we also have particular expertise in machine learning and AI applied to a variety of problems such as logistics. Um, we're pretty good with uh, signal processing and ISR types of things, 3D mapping of infrastructures. We are uh, pretty good at traditional cyber work, meaning network intrusion detection, embedded uh, system security, and also uh, what's closely linked to cybersecurity problems today is quantum informatics. So we also have uh, quite a bit of expertise in that area. As Eugene mentioned, we do uh, have some restrictions because some of these projects are sensitive and that we uh, only have U.S. citizens working on those. We have variety of, of physical security, OPSEC, and access control. And everyone uh, maintains ITAR and export control compliance. But let me move to the main subject of today's talk, and that is our new one-of-a-kind, we think it's one-of-a-kind, cyber autonomy range. And the way this is structured is I'm first going to describe what this is and then move to why we, we believe it's needed. And finally, we will talk about how it's implemented and what it's used for. So to start off with that and to make sure we're all on the same page, let me first briefly mention a traditional cyber range. So these are types of ranges that are in existence now, um, not the new cyber autonomy range we're talking about, but it's certainly built off this idea. So you can see a diagram of a conventional uh, cyber range, and there are a few of these in existence. They're pretty expensive, so not everyone has one, but there's a national cyber range. Raytheon has a very advanced one called the Code Center and a few others around the country. And if you look at the diagram, you can kind of get an idea of what these things are meant to do. They're basically representations of a large enterprise IT system 
that allows for threats to be injected. You can see here on the left. It also allows for training blue team, red team, whereas the red team might inject threats and the blue team might try to mitigate them. So it's got all the infrastructure built around an enterprise's IT system to allow this to happen in a very secure manner because it's kind of like the CDC center. You don't want to be injecting dangerous computer viruses with the chance of them escaping into the outside world. Um, what are they used for? Well, I mentioned a couple of things, but you can see a long list of possible uses there on the left. I'll just mention a few. One of the primary reasons is to define and discover the attack surface. And you can think of an attack surface as all the possible vulnerabilities, the potential vulnerabilities for a particular system. So we want to discover those points of entry where threats could enter our systems. Um, as I mentioned, it's a very safe and controlled environment uh, for obvious reasons. And it also allows a laboratory or facility to try and develop mitigation approaches. If you are attacked, how can you detect it and how can you uh, mitigate that threat? and also security personnel training, and I won't go through the entire list. So that's a traditional cyber range. What we've built is uh, something different and new, but it's built off that concept. And in particular, instead of enterprise IT systems, we're interested in evaluating autonomous systems. So by autonomous systems, I mean things like um, UAVs, like this little yellow UAV helicopter, um, driverless cars that have the ability to do things like object recognition and classification. On the right-hand side is kind of the functional structure that I'll talk about a little bit later. So it's a specialized range to evaluate robots or autonomous systems. It allows for rapid evaluation cycles, which is very important because take a UAV example. If you're evaluating the functionality of a new UAV, you may have to build an expensive prototype, build an expensive uh, field facility, to exercise the prototype, use FAA licensed drone pilots. And then if you inject threats, you may destroy it. So this is a very costly and time consuming process. This, uh, uh, the car, the Cyber Autonomy Ranger car allows for a virtual environment that's that gives us very rapid evaluation cycles with the ability to exercise multiple scenarios in secure, safe, and low-cost manners. And in particular, our facility allows for the injection of actual autonomous system hardware or software in the loop. So we can actually take the entire or portions of um, a UAS, for example, and we can integrate it into this virtual environment such that it thinks it's really flying in the real world when in fact it's flying in this virtual environment the car creates. So we have the ability to create an external environmental digital twin. We do not have to have the actual hardware or software. We also have the capability to emulate or simulate that hardware as well. So some example usages are the cyber attack evaluation and mitigation mission I just mentioned, but also it can be used for other important things like evaluating detection methods for deployed sensors in the environment or, or detecting radiation or, or evaluating the RF spectrum and performing signal analysis, or in general, really, just to evaluate the functionality of any autonomous system application. So why is it needed? Well, 
we're entering the the age of autonomy, as I like to call it. The levels of autonomy are rapidly increasing, and there are standards and specifications that define these levels. For example, for an autonomous vehicle, you can see those levels are zero with no automation up to full automation at level five. And depending on the type of vehicle you're considering, uh, most modern ones are somewhere in the two to four range. Likewise, with UAVs, there's a similar classification and it maps pretty well to the driverless vehicle situation in that level zero has no automation, level five has full automation, and we're seeing uh, systems designed and deployed around the level anywhere from two to four right now with a goal to get to five. Now, why is this important in terms of cybersecurity? Well, I talked about the attack surface earlier. That's the entire surface or uh, list of possible entry points for a threat, and we call those threat vectors. Threat vectors can penetrate attack surfaces. And you think of a, a vehicle, and, and we all know that it's really a, a movable networked computer system nowadays, but it's not a closed system. There's a surprising number of threat vector penetration points. Um, things that might not even immediately come to mind, like the tire pressure monitoring uh, system or um, things like um, vehicle access ECUs, the OBD2 ports when you get your vehicle inspected. So numerous ways to get in to this system and wreak havoc. And the thing to, to remember about autonomous systems is that Essentially, the entry points are sensors that sense the environment and enable the system to then make decisions on its own. So an important layer between the sensor that it senses the environment and the action of the system is machine learning. So really, you can't even talk about autonomous systems nowadays without it automatically involving AI and machine learning, because that's the magic sauce that converts sensed environment input to actions of the system. So this is a big difference between a car and a traditional cyber range. It's not just software anymore. Uh, we think of traditional computer viruses and malware as being malicious code. Well, now we have this entirely expanded set of threats that are due to the data being uh, manipulated. And I'll talk about those in a minute. Furthermore, most autonomous systems depend on wireless communications, either to communicate among themselves or with operators. And so all these threats in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the electromagnetic spectrum that may have been considered as electronic warfare threats 30 to 40 years ago are today's autonomous system cyber attack threats. So, let me give you an example now of this new type of threat that is really not based on software. It's based on data. And this is a well-known example. Some of you may have seen it. It's pretty popular. But this was an experiment where um, Mr. Goodfellow developed a example image classifier. And the purpose of this neural network was to provide it an image of an animal and for it to then classify the type of animal. And you can see on the left an image of a panda. And this classifier, without being tampered with, does correctly classify that image as a panda with uh, nearly 60% confidence. Now, if you look at the image in the middle, that looks like snow or noise on an old analog TV set. And we can see it because it's been amplified. But if you imagine it being, uh, being attenuated by a factor of 0 0.007, 
that becomes a nearly invisible pattern that's not perceptible to humans. And if the image on the left of the panda is added to this highly attenuated noise-like image in the middle, then the result is the image on the right which still looks exactly like a panda in the image on the left. However, if this is now given to that, that image classifier, 90, with 99% confidence, it classifies that as a gibbon, a type of monkey. So this, this image in the middle represents the threat. In fact, we call this a data poisoning threat. No software involved whatsoever, but you can imagine the havoc that can be wreaked if your data gets poisoned on an autonomous system. And these types of threats are emerging. I just showed you an example of data poisoning. Other types are model poisoning. That is the, the classifier, which is you can think of it as kind of a nonlinear filter with filter coefficients. If those filter coefficients get modified, which are just values, then you poison the model and can cause it to malfunction. Equally important is tampering with the sensors themselves. It could be that there's a vulnerability in a sensor such that if a certain pattern or color is shown or exposed to a camera, it causes it to malfunction. Or there could be a, yes. Sorry, can I interrupt you just for a second? Absolutely. So while you're talking about the sensors, I just want to let everybody know that Ryan Fulterman put up an article about hacking a car through a headlights. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I'll have to look at that. This this is a huge problem with sensors. I mean, if you think about traditional I.O., a lot of those attacks for traditional computers through the I.O. devices, right? And it's the same concept here. Um, if you modify or spoof those sensors or data sources, you can wreak all kinds of havoc down the line on the system. So that's very important. And the car is capable of modeling these sensors, evaluating them, and, and suggesting mitigations to um, increase their security. And then the fourth broad category of these types of attacks uh, you've probably heard of are deep fakes. And that is where somehow the environmental or sensed data is fake and it's caused to represent something that's not truly in the environment. These are all data attacks that affect the AI, ML, artificial intelligence, machine learning parts of the autonomous system. And this is what the cyber autonomy range is designed to work with that is not present in a traditional cyber range. And this is not just some set of problems we've dreamed up and, and hasn't occurred in, in the real world. In fact, we've seen many examples of these data types of attacks in the recent uh, conflict in Ukraine. There's a list of others there. I won't read through those, but I do have a 20 second video that I think um, describes this visually. And let, before I play it, let me point out some features. If you look at the, the lane that's oncoming traffic and I'm circling a man standing in this lane, presumably the driver of this overturned truck is standing there to warn cars, hey, my truck's blocking your lane. And what you're going to see when I play the video in this same lane is a white Tesla coming towards that overturned vehicle. And it's it's actually on autopilot. And some of you may have seen this. It's kind of an older one. It's from 2020. But let me play this and keep a close eye on the white vehicle approaching the man here. And remember how this works. That autopilot is sensing the environment through a camera that's uh, receiving images that are processed by a neural network that then control the movement of the vehicle. So here comes the Tesla. This has been slowed down. The man's waving wildly, 
And that is a perfect example of the type of threats we're trying to evaluate, whether they are unintentional or intentional. We've got to harden these autonomous systems that are pervasive in our lives and are going to become more so in the future. So, if I may, yes. Me. Sorry. Yes. There's please. also been examples where uh, Tesla ha was confused by stickers put on the road for their autopilot, and then there was another system that was actually projecting false speed limit signs, and that was changing the speed that the vehicle was going. Absolutely, and that's those are prime examples of the category that I referred to as sensor spoofing. So you're tricking the sensor and causing then the system to behave uh, in, a, in a malfunctioning way. So those are the types of threats we're worried about. Thanks for, for bringing that up. Um, so now I'm going to move to how is the car implemented. And this is kind of a functional diagram. I've alluded to some of this before, but um, we have a system under evaluation or system under test. It could be emulated or actual. For example, it could be the autonomy stack, that is the layers of software in an autonomous system. And what we would do is instantiate that actual software into one of our servers in the facility. And then surrounding that, we would supply the sensor inputs with virtualized environmental information. And we would incorporate physics simulators so that this software shouldn't know that it's not actually in a actual UAV platform flying in the real world because we can simulate not only sensor inputs, but all kinds of environmental uh, characteristics. That means that we also have to have an expanded new library of threats um, not just the old traditional malware threats, but these new categories of data threats. And, and another great thing about our facility is that we can create those synthetically with our virtualization, and we can build libraries of curated data threats um, and benign examples as well that can be used to evaluate systems. And all of that has to be orchestrated, of course. So we have the entire package in the cloud. We emulate sensors, the AIML portions, um, NAV, if that's applicable, the controllers for the control surfaces of the platform, and monitor things even like power usage and external communication. <clears throat> Another important aspect of this is that our facility is connected through secure links to an enormous uh, HPC. In fact, our university houses the largest HPC in Northeast Texas. And why do we need that? Well, we need the HPC for all these complicated and intricate physics engine simulations in the virtual environment. Moreover, we have an even more important resource. Um, I, I just mentioned we can generate synthetic data and curate it and retrain these networks. That requires an enormous amount of data. So we're only the second university in the US to house an NVIDIA SuperPod, which you can see here in the lower right. So you can think of this as a GPU supercomputer. And so we really need all this heavy duty computational horsepower and data processing horsepower to accomplish the mission of the car. Another aspect that makes the car unique is our virtualization um, capabilities to, to emulate uh, the virtual environment. And so we're using a, a set of software that was actually developed originally for a DARPA project that allows a lot of capabilities. If you look on the left here, you can see that we can define terrain files um, directly from GIS systems. And that includes 
uh, suburban, rural, low-rise urban, high-rise urban, maritime, all kinds of different actual terrains can be uploaded. We can also um, uh, virtualize terrestrial and space weather. We can even specify antenna patterns. You can see on the right, the, this UAV I'm circling has the antenna patterns superimposed over it. Um, so we can really essentially build a digital twin of the environment. And in terms of the RF spectrum, we can model things like uh, the path loss and multipath characteristics. We can uh, not only model the communication links among these various transmitters and receivers, but we actually physically define the bits in the physical layer. So we can we have 17 different standard protocols, Wi-Fi, military comms, you name it, that we can define for our data links and actually send real world data over those links. We also have the capability to uh, develop custom protocols or implement custom protocols from the customer. We can instantiate things like jammers, even radiation sources and IR and UV sources. Now, I mentioned that we can inject actual bit streams. We don't just simulate comm links. <laughs> we generate data that flows among those uh, comm links in our environment. And that's done with a, a pretty um, advanced piece of hardware. This is a traffic generator that we can configure to generate the bit streams that go over the protocols in our virtual environment. And when we fire this thing up, it sounds like a jet engine in it, taken off in the lab. We can do up to 40 gigabits per second of bandwidth in generating comm data with this thing. The other important aspect of how it's implemented is security. Um, again, as I mentioned, this is like a CDC lab. We don't want some of these new poison data attacks or sensor spoofing attacks to get out into the wild and the internet. So you can see here on the lower left, we have multiple levels of segregation and that we can use to isolate our system. At the lowest level here, you can see the system under test and the custom interfaces. We have a user center that can be used to monitor and inject attacks. Here's a, a rendition of the user center. Um, and then through a dedicated, secure, dual fiber link, we can also connect directly to our uh, data center that houses the HPC and the SuperPod. But we can sever all these links and run in a totally isolated manner when we're dealing with really dangerous things. We also have this thing fully scrubbable. So in between projects, everything is scrubbed down to, to bare metal before it's, even the operating systems are erased, everything. For every project, there's typically some custom work to be done, and that's really to instrument around <coughs> the system under test. Whether that be an actual piece of hardware, an emulation, a software stack, we need to instrument um, in the input interface and the output interface to monitor the behavior of this system. And then here on the left, you can see that we have uh, virtualized sensor input coming in. We have user input from the users in the data center, in the user center. We have comm links coming in that come from the traffic generator and other types of sensors. Then we monitor these outputs and the whole thing can be viewed on this large screen in the user center in multiple abstractions. We can give you a view of how it looks in the virtual world. If you were in there looking at it with your eyeballs, we can look at electromagnetic spectrums or other levels of abstraction in real time. 
The final very important piece uh, or ingredient, I should say, of how the car is implemented is that it requires specialized expertise. And so I'm so privileged to work with a group of experts that combined provide everything we need. Um, for example, Mr. Bigham, who may be in the audience now, he and I are the ones that first decided we might need a facility, and then it got vetted and eventually built. But <clears throat> he has expertise in ISR, EW, and autonomy, former chief innovation officer at Raytheon. Uh, Mr. Bradbury actually designed and operated the advanced traditional cyber range at Raytheon, and he now works for us with the car. We have expertise in program management. We have expertise in AI, ML, signal processing, and we have expertise in the optics, photonics, and RF spectrum. So all these people are essential to making the car happen. And I'm going to end with just kind of a, an OV1 or cartoon of an example application we're working on right now. This is a, a functional evaluation of an array of autonomous systems. And the idea is that um, these little blue disks represent UAVs and Here's a, a ground-based um, autonomous system. The idea is that these form an array, a sensor array, that is designed to geolocate a transmitter in a GPS-denied environment. And so what's novel about this system is that uh, by taking just one measurement, we can locate or estimate that transmitter within an area shown by this kind of shaded blue oval. But just by moving the positions of the sensors around and taking a second measurement, we can greatly reduce the area or location errors of that transmitter. So this is something that would be very expensive to implement in the real world, to build a real world range to evaluate it. And we're doing all this in our environment. So the last thing that I wanted to mention, actually it's an ask more than a, a mention, is that um, we have this thing open, available, and ready to support projects. So I would ask the audience if you have any interest or you know of colleagues that may have interest to please let them know about our facility. I have a brochure. Eugene's got a brochure. We can give that out for the car and we're happy to entertain any kinds of Q&A uh, with your, your contacts. Um, any suggestions for improvements to <laughs> our, capabil our capabilities would also be of great interest to us. Um, we are available to partner with you <laughs> for joint proposals, or if you want to use our facility to evaluate your systems, we can do so under contracting. And, and I think I mentioned that even for uh, sensitive defense types of projects, we're capable of supporting those. So I want to thank you for your attention. I'm hoping to have some Q&A and I would ask that you feel free to contact me for any of these items. Thank you, Mitch. Um, Howard Meyer, did you have something to say? No, I do not. Sorry. That's all right. All right, Carl. Hey, Mitch, okay. thanks for the talk. I'm really interested in the facility. Uh, one of your charts showed a, uh, a computer mock-up of what the facility would look like, and I'm not sure if that was for the purposes of the assessment, but I was just curious, it, it, does the facility exist today or are you just finalizing the construction? Are you ready in the future? It exists and it's open for uh, operation and I really should replace those artist renderings of actual pictures. I would say that that user center I showed you, it looks almost identical. And I do have photographs, so um, it's open, we're running, it's ready to go. And are you doing anything with the U.S. government and do you have the capability of doing classified work? 
we have the capability to do classified work. Um, we have a secure facility. We're capable of holding and issuing clearances. Um, and we do have a, an on-prem facility. Okay, Eric, go ahead. Hey, Mitch. Hey, early in the presentation, you you, um, you had a slide that talked about a threat, your threat emulation. Um, just curious in terms of um, how how is that threat validated? Um, you know, what to what level uh, do you uh, are you able to uh, bring forth an environment that replicates an advanced threat, uh, say from you know North Korea, China, Iran, uh, from both the op four, you know, the people themselves operating with the tools, uh, with the tactics, techniques, and procedures that that adversary might use. How how do you do that? And it really is. It, do you, are you tied in with the intelligence community in order to kind of validate that, that your threat representation is, is valid? Over. Yeah, thank you. We do have IC um, interactions um, with a, a, a variety of agencies. And as to how we do it, it depends on how much information we're given. So at one extreme, if we're given an exact um, um, e example system, and we're given exact specifications of the threat and the response, we can certainly create the virtual image, the digital twin of that, and show that through equivalence matching that, that we can match it. On the other extreme, if we're just searching for new threats, then if we if we uncover what we think is a new threat, then we would, um, develop the same environment exactly replica that's benign or clean without the presence of the threat and then we would um, exercise the benign example environment with the environment the image environment that has the threat to validate <laughs> that it does indeed respond to the threat um, how well can we do that validation well if we're just emulating a system, that's about as good as we can do. But if we have actual hardware and software, then we can show that it exists on that actual system. So I know that's kind of a mealy mouth dancer, but it really depends on how much information we have access to. Um, I see a hand raised by... Um, yeah, this is uh, Kevin yeah. Baugh. I, oh, sorry, I, I thought Gene, I, Gene, I thought was uh, doing the moderating here, so yeah, <laughs> I was just waiting my turn. <laughs> um, so one of the things that uh, I really liked your presentation, Mitch. Thank you. Um, one of the things that, and it seems like there's lots of cyber guys on the line here, so uh, that's interesting in its own right. But um, one of the challenges I think the community faces is that um, if you look at the technologies that are happening around us, so. You talked a lot about UAVs, but you could talk about communications. You could talk about data processing. All of that seems to be getting cheaper. And the only thing that's not getting cheaper is the cyber stuff because the, you know, the, the attack surfaces are getting more complex. Uh, the ways you can get in are getting more complex. The amount of research that needs to be done is getting uh, more difficult. And, and as I think about it, uh, it, it seems like we might be doing things wrong. Can you hear me? Am I still on? Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. And that the, that laundry list of issues you just mentioned was, in fact, a big part of our motivation to build this facility. There, the threats are just too complicated, too costly to 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 exercise in the real world in a lab, and and it's it takes too much time. We need to go through thousands of threat scenarios, not a handful on real systems. So, so all those things you mentioned, I agree with you are problems and, and we're trying to uh, attack that with our virtual system here. And that's one of the reasons I asked for suggestions for improvements. We know we we don't have the perfect solution, but we would like to think we're honing in on a a better and better approach. Yeah, my question is really, are we even looking at it from the right angle, huh. right? Well, in part because you know, looking at it from the outside in or each of the individual pieces, the you know traditional reductionist approach, yeah, just seems to be leading us to an infinite cost curve, and could, and that's not I, that's crazy. I, I, Kevin, I, it's Eugene. This is why we're here. 
yeah. to look at and, it from all the different perspectives. And and another aspect as well to 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 Kevin's comment is that, and, and I think this may be where you're going with this, Kevin, is that in the cyber community, we tend to still be reactive um, rather than proactive, meaning that we're searching for these uh, threats and trying to mitigate them after the fact, after the system's been built. And we really need, in my opinion, to think about moving to a more proactive approach. And you hear terms like design for security. Unfortunately, the reality is in a lot of systems, the emphasis is still on functionality first with cybersecurity as an afterthought. And until we can get around that, that obstacle and think about it from day one, we're probably still gonna be reactionary. Totally agree. Thank you. And nobody else has their hand up. Any other questions? Anything on the first slide that um, Mitch had up about all the other capabilities? I want to get Mitch back on to talk quantum. Sure. Yeah, I can show that slide if if you'd like. Yeah, because some people came in late. Yeah, like I was saying earlier, you know, the idea behind this, if you weren't here in the beginning, is to expose uh, a broad community to these capabilities. It's not just the cyber people that this applies to. It, it applies to everybody in manufacturing, in the healthcare, wherever it is. I so couldn't agree. We want to get all these opinions, all these perspectives, where this will apply, and then come up with the solutions to the challenges we all face. I couldn't agree more. Every Everyone needs cyber. If you're dealing with <laughs> an artifact that has software or a network interface, then you should be concerned about cyber. And one of the things I would like to point out about our general capabilities here is that we're not the type of cyber research institute that is incremental or evolutionary. In other words, we're not sitting around trying to build a better firewall. Wall. We're trying to take these basic principles of science that are being exploited in emerging threats and just go back to the basics. For example, our heavy involvement with quantum uh, is due to the fact <laughs> that, as, as you probably all heard, when quantum computers mature to the right size, they're going to break current encryption capabilities. Uh, we've been working in the quantum area since before the quantum area was well known because of these types of problems. Um, in terms of traditional cyber, you'll see I've emphasized low level physical layer stuff because right now we're seeing more and more IoT devices as, as I think Kevin mentioned, these cheap inexpensive devices that all have processors and a network interface so we we really need those are those are really increasing our 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 attack surface to get in it's not the cheap smart light bulb that's insecure that's a problem it's the fact that the cheap smart light bulb has a network interface to a critical larger system and it's a, and it's an entry point so we do lots of work at the hardware and physical layer level and then the other thing that that is in the news right now i see it all the time is the ai threat the AI, ai cyber threat so it is true that all this advancing ai that we think we're pretty good at can be looked at as the source of threats but it also can be looked at as new technology to mitigate or combat those threats and so we work on both sides of of that uh angle and then finally i would mention i i had a a little blurb hey, that said, yes i just want to get back to to the car oh okay um, i thought so, you wanted and, this overview <laughs> oh no no okay so somebody put something in the chat oh okay i wanted to get back to that so andy asked if the car can be linked to other national ranges yes it can as a matter of fact um 
when we had the idea to build the car, it was so expensive that we wanted to vet the idea. So we had a consortium of stakeholders that included IBM, Goldman Sachs, Toyota, Raytheon, to vet the idea. Is this something we really need? Does this already exist? And um, happily, they all said, yeah, we need it. We don't think it exists. But the other key thing that came out of that is to be sure and make sure you can connect it to existing traditional cyber ranges. And that's this path here at the top, the internet uh, access that we can control carefully. So the answer is yes. Well, can you unmute, Andy? Or are you good with that answer? All right, sounds good. All right, so there was something I wanted to say, Mitchell. I can't remember. Um, oh. I was just saying on the um, on the general general um, capabilities, and it was the, my last point actually, is that I mentioned in my slide set that yesterday's ZW problems are today's cyber problems, and that's why we also have expertise and focus in uh, RF, comm systems, ISR. Um, optics, photonics, all that kind of traditional EMAG e, e sensing and processing. Hey, are there any other questions for Mitch? Unmute if you have a question. All right. So I'm not seeing anything, Mitch. Okay. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Hey, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. And we'll set something up for the, for the quantum. And I'm sure we'll be in touch because I've got a lot of people pinging on me here. Okay. Sounds great. All right. So before we wrap this up really quick, I want to uh, make an announcement that if anybody has any challenges, if you have any solutions, if you know of a technology out there that needs to be shared on this forum, please send it to me. Everything gets vetted. It's got to meet one criteria, and that is it's got to be new, novel, or innovative. So please forward those to me, and we'll get you or the technologies on here. I want to thank everybody for being here. If you have any questions for me, I believe everybody has my either my email or my LinkedIn. Uh, we won't have a session on the 14th of February. Had a hard time finding people that would book on Valentine's Day. So the next forum will be on the 21st of February. Start looking at uh, tracking your LinkedIn and your email inbox for that invite. Take care.